Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to continue discussing endocrine pharmacology, but now we're going to shift our focus to the thyroid gland and the hormones that it makes. Now, just as a brief review, and I'm going to be brief with this because we've talked about it in other videos, let's review this axis between the hypothalamus up here, the pituitary gland right here, and then the thyroid gland shown here at the bottom. In order for the thyroid gland here to make thyroid hormones, it's actually dependent on a couple of other hormones that are made up here in these top structures. So this structure up here at the very top that I'm outlining, this is actually the hypothalamus. It's actually part of the brain. And then you can see there's this structure that dangles off of the hypothalamus inferiorly. This whole structure is called the pituitary. Now technically this darker structure uh, is the posterior pituitary and the one that's brighter pink is the anterior pituitary. We're only concerned here about the anterior pituitary which also is called the adenohypophysis. Now the hypothalamus manufactures a hormone called TRH which stands for thyrotropin releasing hormone. Now recall that between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, there's a network of blood vessels that you can't actually see in this picture. And TRH, once made by the hypothalamus, travels down that network of blood vessels and it makes its way here to the anterior pituitary. And thyrotropin releasing hormone stimulates the anterior pituitary to make and release thyroid stimulating hormone. And you can see that thyroid stimulating hormone is released from the anterior pituitary and travels down here to the thyroid gland. One quick note here, thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH is also called thyrotropin. These are one and the same. So that's why this hormone up here is called thyrotropin releasing hormone because it stimulates the release of thyrotropin from the anterior pituitary, which is the same thing as TSH. But in any case, once TSH goes from the anterior pituitary through the general circulation to the thyroid, the TSH then stimulates the thyroid to make thyroid hormones, and those are then released into the blood. And the major two thyroid hormones are T3 and T4. The exact reason that they're named this will be discussed later in the video. And then these thyroid hormones exert negative feedback on the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. So if the thyroid gland suddenly becomes a little bit too active and it makes too much thyroid hormones, then we're going to have elevated thyroid hormones in the blood. So this is a negative feedback system, so we're going to bring the thyroid hormone levels back down. The way this happens is these thyroid hormones tell the anterior pituitary to stop making as much TSH. That makes sense because TSH normally increases the amount of thyroid hormone output by the thyroid gland. Well, if we already have enough thyroid hormones, then they can tell the anterior pituitary to make less TSH. And the same thing goes for the hypothalamus. They tell the hypothalamus to make less TRH. Although generally, when you're looking at lab values, you'll never see TRH. Uh, the main one that you'll actually see is TSH levels. So let's now look at two extreme cases where the thyroid hormones are out of whack. That would be hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. So in hyperthyroidism, we have elevated thyroid hormones to the extent that they're actually out of the normal range. They're way too high. So in the blood, we have elevated T3 and T4. Now, these are exerting that negative feedback on the anterior pituitary, so that way it's releasing less TSH. We already have enough thyroid hormones, we have more than enough, so we don't need as much TSH. And so the levels of these thyroid hormones and TSH are always going to be inversely related. So the higher the thyroid hormones, the lower the TSH. So if a physician were to take a blood panel and they were to get a TSH level that was low, below the normal uh, range, that would actually indirectly indicate that the person may have hyperthyroidism because low TSH is going to correspond with high levels of thyroid hormone. Sometimes they'll look at both of these values, both thyroid hormones and TSH, but normally if they're going to look at one only, it's going to be the TSH level. And so this gives an indirect uh, indication of how high or low the thyroid hormones are. Conversely, we could also have hypothyroidism. So this is where the levels of thyroid hormones are actually low. And if thyroid hormone is low, what might we expect TSH to be? 
high. And so if you come back with a blood panel where they're looking at TSH and you find it to be above the normal range, so elevated, that actually means that your thyroid hormones are probably low and you potentially have hypothyroidism. So let's now get into the physiology of how the thyroid hormones are made. And as we go along, we'll actually see the points in the pathway where pharmacological intervention is usually used. So here's your thyroid gland, and embedded in here are the follicular cells. So the follicular cells in this picture are shown in gray. And to the left, we have extracellular fluid, which would be where the interstitial fluid and ultimately the blood is. And then on the other side, we have the lumen. And thyroid hormone synthesis is really going to span between the follicular cell cytoplasm and the lumen of the thyroid. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. So here's one follicular cell right here. It has a cell nucleus, and the nucleus, of course, is where we have the DNA. Why is that important? Because thyroid hormone synthesis doesn't just involve small molecules. It actually involves a large protein. So, of course, to make this protein, we have to have the processes of gene expression, transcription and translation. So the DNA within the nucleus has to be transcribed, so we get mRNA. And then the mRNA is translated into this protein shown right here. This protein has a name. It's called thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin. This is where all the thyroid hormones are going to come from. Also, thyroid hormone synthesis is going to require iodide. This is the anionic form of iodine. And this iodide, or I- is going to have to be transported from the blood um, and ultimately into the follicular cell. And so at this point, we have iodide and we have thyroglobulin, this protein. Notice that the thyroglobulin here and the iodide have to be transported from the follicular cell into the lumen of the thyroid. Now the iodide is going to use a transport protein specific for iodide. That's not shown here, and it ends up in the lumen. The thyroglobulin here is going to use a protein complex called pendrin in order to ultimately move into the lumen of the thyroid. You'll notice here that the thyroglobulin, I have several amino acids labeled. These are all tyrosines. Now, technically, these tyrosines were present over here in this thyroglobulin. Nothing's changed. I just didn't put them there for the sake of clarity. But understand that we've got critical tyrosine amino acid residues here that are part of the protein structure, and they're going to be chemically modified uh, using this iodide. Okay. Now, how is that done? Well, it's done via an enzyme called thyroperoxidase, also called thyroid peroxidase. What this enzyme does is it oxidizes iodide and allows it to be attached onto several of these tyrosine amino acids. Okay? So whenever one iodine atom is added to these tyrosines, it's termed MIT. And when two iodines are added to the tyrosines, it's termed DIT. And again, the enzyme that catalyzes this is thyroperoxidase, also called thyroid peroxidase. So here's a representation of our protein thyroglobulin, and here is one tyrosine amino acid. You can see it right here. This is its chemical structure. With one reaction of thyroperoxidase, we attach one iodine atom onto this tyrosine amino acid. When we've attached one iodine, it's termed MIT, which stands for monoiodotyrosine. That makes sense. Well, this MIT can actually undergo another reaction of thyroperoxidase. It doesn't have to, but it can, in which a second iodine is added right here. Notice both iodines actually flank this hydroxyl group. And now that there's two iodines, it's DIT, which, as you might guess, is diiodotyrosine. So back to this. We still have our chemically modified thyroglobulin right here, some MITs and some DITs. Well, it's now going to undergo more reactions with thyroid peroxidase. Now, at the end of all these reactions, we may still have some MITs and some DITs. But what it's important is we have these pre-T3s and pre-T4s. Okay, The pre comes from the fact that these are the precursors to the thyroid hormones, but they're still chemically part of the protein. They haven't actually been released from the protein. So how exactly does that work? Well, here's our MIT up here. And thyroid peroxidase can catalyze another reaction where it basically adds on this whole moiety down here. Okay? What it's actually doing is it's taking a pre-existing DIT, cutting off the ring, and attaching it on this oxygen right here. Okay? So now we have what was the MIT up here at the top, and now we have this other ring structure with two iodines on it. 
Okay, there's three iodines total on this, so this would be pre-T3, or pre-triiodothyronine. It's no longer tyrosine, it's now termed thyronine because we've now attached the ring structure on this oxygen. Okay, but it's pre because it's still attached to thyroglobulin. The same thing can happen if we couple two DITs together. So notice we still have this DIT moiety up here, but a reaction of thyroid peroxidase in this manner will now give us this structure, which now has four total iodines, two here and then two here, so four. This would be pre-T4 or pre-tetraiodothyronine. So now this chemically modified thyroglobulin is going to be endocytosed back into the follicular cell. So we're done in the lumen. The endocytosis is aided by this protein complex called megalin. And because of the endocytosis, this thyroglobulin is contained within an endosome. The endosome is combined with a lysosome to form a lysoendosome, and the lysosomal enzymes basically break down this protein, and they break all these pieces off of it. So yes, we still have potentially some MITs and DITs. The iodine from those is recycled back into this process. But what's important here is we now have generated mature T3 and mature T4, and these can then be moved into the blood where they then go to peripheral tissues to exert their functions. So again, here's our pre-T3, here's our pre-T4, and via the proteolysis that occurs due to the lysosomal enzymes, and we get the degradation of thyroglobulin and release of now mature T3 on the left here and T4 on the right. Now, the first drug target we're going to look at is actually on thyroid peroxidase. And there's a class of drugs called thioamides that are actually used in the treatment of hyperthyroidism. So let's remember what hyperthyroidism is. We have excessive activity of the thyroid, and so the T3 and T4 levels in the blood are excessive. Well, one of the ways that we could potentially bring down the thyroid hormone levels is by somehow inhibiting the synthesis of the thyroid hormones, right? Well, really in the synthesis, the major player is thyroid peroxidase. So that would actually be the obvious target to inhibit, right? If we inhibit this enzyme, then this biosynthetic pathway is inhibited and we're gonna get less T3 and less T4. So here are the two major thioamides. One of them is methimazole, and the other shown here is propothiouracil, okay? Um, the dangers to watch out with these, for propothiouracil, you do have to watch out for liver damage or liver toxicity. For methimazole, you have to worry about agranulocytosis. So in short, these drugs are going to inhibit thyroid peroxidase, which is going to inhibit the biosynthetic pathway and lead to less T3 and T4 production, and that's going to help bring thyroid hormone levels down, okay? So again, just to name these, we've got triiodothyronine, which is T3, again named because we've got three atoms of iodine, and then tetraiodothyronine, or T4, which is named because it has four atoms of iodine. Now, tetraiodothyronine, or T4, has another common name, and it's called thyroxin. So sometimes you actually won't hear the term tetraiodothyronine, they'll actually just use the term thyroxin. Those are one and the same. One thing that's really important to understand here is that when the thyroid gland makes these couple of hormones, it's making a lot more of T4 by quantity. So if you actually compare the amount of these two in the blood, there's gonna be a lot more T4 than there is T3. However, T3 has a lot more biological activity. So both of these hormones are able to influence things like heat production, metabolic rate, growth of tissues, right? But T3 is much better at it. T3 is more potent. T4 is less potent, but there's more of T4 in the blood. So when these two hormones get to their target cells, T3 is fine as is. It's able to bind to receptors inside the cytoplasm of cells and exert effects. However, T4 is not quite ready to exert its effects. And that's because T4 has to first be converted back to T3. So this is something that occurs at the level of the target cell, not in the thyroid. One of these iodine atoms, in particular this one in red, will be removed uh, by the target cell and it will be converted effectively back to T3 when that removal occurs. This is catalyzed by an enzyme that's expressed at the target cells called tetraiodothyronine deiodinase, or sometimes just called deiodinase. And so it catalyzes the removal of this iodine atom right here, and so it converts T4 
to T3. And so then the T3 can exert more biological activity at the level of the cell. Also notice that this enzyme, the deiodinase, is selenium dependent. It's one of the few enzymes in humans that relies on selenium. And so if you have a person who is grossly selenium deficient, it can actually mimic hypothyroidism because they're gonna have T4 and they may have some T3 because the thyroid hormone can make these, right? But at the level of the target tissues, they're not gonna be able to convert that T4 into T3. And so there's gonna be more attempt by T4 to exert the same effects, but it's not as potent. And so they're gonna have overall less pro-thyroid hormone effects because they can't convert the T4 to T3. Okay. So in that case, they would just need to consume more selenium, and there's a lot of food sources that have this. One really good one are Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts have an absurd amount of selenium. If you ever go look at these in the store, the percentage of the daily value for like two nuts is over 100%. It's pretty crazy. All right, so now let's switch gears and talk about the last pharmacological treatment. And let's say for somebody with hypothyroidism. So somebody has hypothyroidism, that means the thyroid gland is underactive. The levels of these hormones are low. So what should we do? Should we give an agonist? No, actually all we do is we just administer this drug level thyroxine, sometimes called Synthroid. The molecule level thyroxine literally is thyroxine. Okay? It gets this fancy name, but it literally is just administering thyroxine. It's not an analog, it's not an agonist, it's not a mimetic, it literally is thyroxine. Same molecule, same molecular structure. So it really is just thyroid supplementation therapy. You're literally just giving this molecule. Now my question to you is, why would we give somebody T4, the less biologically active one, and not just give them the more biologically active T3? Well, it has to do with the fact that if we give them T4, this already has a narrow therapeutic window or therapeutic index, meaning that there's a very small window between when it's therapeutic and when it's toxic. And that's when it's the less biologically active form. If you gave T3 the more biologically active form, it would be very hard to give an appropriate and non-lethal dose because that narrow therapeutic index would actually drastically shrink. So that wouldn't make sense. Also, any of the T4 that we give in the form of levothyroxine can be converted to T3. And this enzyme right here is regulated by the body. So the body can make more of it as needed or it can actually remove some of the enzyme if you need less of it. And so by administering T4, not only do we have a better therapeutic index, it's still narrow, but it's more reasonable, but the body can actually further regulate this by actually upregulating or downregulating the levels of this deiodinase, which can fine tune the levels of T3. So it makes it much more advantageous and safer to use T4 instead of just straight up giving T3. So hopefully that gave you a good overview of thyroid hormone synthesis and why we target certain areas the way we do. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.